in the far reaches of southern Siberia, where the Altai Mountains rise like ancient sentinels over the Cherish River, there exists a cave, quiet now, forgotten by time, and carved into the limestone like a wound that never healed. This is Chakirskaya, a place once cold and windswept as it is today, but nearly 60,000 years ago, it beat with life. Life not of our kind, but of those who once walked the earth beside us, the Neanderthals. These were not just any Neanderthals. These were the Chagirshkaya Neanderthals, members of the easternmost known branch of a people long thought to have been confined to the landscapes of Europe. Their presence here changes everything. Their bones, their tools, their very DNA reach out from the darkness of that cave to tell a story we are only just beginning to understand. If you're captivated by this unfolding human journey, make sure to subscribe to Prehistoric Medievals. Your support lets us keep exploring these ancient mysteries together. The Chigirshkaya Neanderthals were not Siberians born of that land. They were travelers, migrants from the West, who had journeyed across thousands of kilometers, and they brought everything with them, their tools, their culture, their memories. Archaeologists discovered over 90 Neanderthal fossils in this cave, teeth, jaws, fragments of skulls and limbs. These bones, fragile and scattered, date from 59,000 to 49,000 years ago, a time when the earth was locked in glacial cold, when survival demanded strength, resilience, and perhaps above all, tradition. Beside those bones, researchers unearthed something even more astonishing. Over 90,000 stone tools, not crude, not local, these were Mikokian tools, beautifully shaped bifaces, leaf points, and asymmetrical scrapers, the same kind of tools used in Central Europe and Crimea. Their presence here is not coincidence, it is continuity. It is proof that this group carried not only their bodies eastward, but also their minds, their culture, and their inherited knowledge. And that's not just theory. When scientists compared these tools to those found in La Ferrasi in France and Vindija in Croatia, the resemblance was unmistakable. The same craftsmanship, the same designs, thousands of kilometers apart, separated by mountains and steppes. The implications are profound. These were not just people using Mikokian tools. These were Mikokian people people whose identities were wrapped in that technology, carried with them from the Dordogne Valley across Germany, through the Crimean Plains, all the way to the shadows of Siberia. This isn't the story of isolated survivors scraping out a life in some forgotten corner of Asia. This is the story of a people on the move. The Tagiskaya Neanderthals were part of a migration stream that may have begun in the Eemian interglacial around 130,000 years ago, when Europe warmed and Neanderthal populations spread across the continent. Crimea during that time became a hub, a refuge, a crossroads of culture and survival. It was from there, as the world grew cold again around 70,000 years ago, that these people may have pushed eastward chasing herds across the open steppe, following the rivers, the Don, the Volga, and then into the Alai Corridor. Genetics confirms what the stones already tell us. Ancient DNA extracted from the bones at Chagirskaya reveals a remarkable link, not to the local Denisovan-related Neanderthals of nearby caves, but to the Western lineages. The Chagirskaya individuals are more closely related to the Vinja Neanderthal from Croatia, one of the best-sequenced Neanderthal genomes on record, than they are to the much older Altai Neanderthal who once lived just a short distance away at Denisova Cave. This is no accident of time. This is population movement. This is the long arm of migration reaching into Siberia. 
The DNA shows it clearly. Mitochondrial and nuclear sequences, even Y chromosome markers, all point to a Western origin. And the diversity? Surprisingly low. These weren't masses of people spreading out across the continent. They were a small, tightly knit group, a founding population, a bottleneck, shaped by the cold and the journey. The same genetic contractions seen in other Neanderthal groups who faced the icy grip of glacial cycles. Even more striking, these migrants showed no signs of mixing with their Denisovan cousins, despite being in the same region. At a time when interbreeding was known to occur across archaic humans, the Chagirstaya group stood apart, culturally, genetically, perhaps even socially. They remained distinct, maintaining their identity in a landscape both foreign and unforgiving. If you're enjoying this deep dive into the ancient world, don't forget to subscribe to Prehistoric Medievals. These forgotten stories from our distant past are fragile, and your support keeps them from fading into silence. The bones of Chuggerskaya speak not only through their genes, but through their form. Thick cortical walls, heavy brow ridges, the sloped forehead, the projecting midface, all hallmark traits of Neanderthals across Europe. But look closer, and the details begin to emerge. The teeth show heavy wear, signs of a tough diet and possible non-dietary use, perhaps processing hides or gripping materials. The femora and tibiae are short and sturdy, adaptations to cold, the kind of traits predicted by Allen's and Bergman's rules, compact, heat-conserving bodies shaped by millennia in glacial environments. Muscle attachments are deeply worn, suggesting powerful limbs, relentless use. The daily life of these people wasn't abstract. It was brutal, but it was also skilled. Their hands shaped stone, carved wood, processed carcasses. The robustness of their skeletons speaks to a life of constant movement and manual precision. These anatomical clues draw clear lines back to La Ferrasi in France, another site of classic Neanderthal remains. There, too, the bones tell of strength and a life built around survival. And like the people of Chuggerskaya, the La Ferrasi Neanderthals likely lived in small, close-knit groups, possibly families who hunted large mammals and knew the rhythms of their landscape intimately. As we reflect on these shared traits across time and distance, remember to hit that subscribe button for prehistoric medievals, because this isn't just ancient history, it's the story of us, of where we come from, and of who we once walked beside. The climate tells the rest. During the Amin, forests expanded, temperatures rose, and Neanderthals reclaimed Europe and beyond. Crimea flourished as a center of culture and occupation. But as the earth tilted back toward cold, these people followed the herds east, across the steppes, through the river valleys, and into the cold breath of Siberia. They didn't just survive, they endured, and they brought with them not only their tools and their genes, but their memory. And the cave of Chagurskaya holds that memory still, frozen in time, waiting to be understood. The journey doesn't end in the stone tools or even in the DNA. To truly understand the Chagurskaya and Neanderthals, we must look deeper into their hands, their finger bones, their phalanges, preserved by the cold and dust of time, offer a rare glimpse into how these people lived, worked, and interacted with their world. The hands of Chagurskaya were strong, purposeful, and built for action. The bones show thick cortical walls, firm muscle attachments, and signs of forceful, repeated use. These were hands designed not just to survive, but to do, to craft, to shape, to strike. And yet even in this, the Chagurskaya Neanderthals tell us something remarkable. Their manual phalanges are robust, yes, but not hyper-robust. Not like those of their distant neighbors, the Neanderthals of Denisova Cave. There, bones such as the now-famous pinky finger from Denisova III exhibit astonishing strength, 
dense bone walls, powerful apical tufts, and a level of reinforcement more extreme than typical Neanderthals. It's so unusual, in fact, that some researchers, like Dr. Mednikova, have proposed something radical. That these traits may have come not from Neanderthals at all, but from tropical modern humans. Yes, tropical modern humans, early Homo sapiens, who lived in forested, rugged environments, may have developed strong, muscular hands suited for climbing, gripping, and manipulating complex materials like vines and wood. And through ancient, now lost episodes of interbreeding, introgression, those traits may have passed into the Denisovan Neanderthal population of the Altai region. A fusion of ancient peoples whose bones still carry the imprint of forgotten encounters. If that fascinates you like it does us, subscribe to Prehistoric Medievals. There's so much more waiting to be uncovered. Mednikova's theory turns conventional wisdom on its head. We often associate robust bones with cold climate adaptation. But these Denisovan finger bones, far thicker than those of Chagorskaya or La Pharisee, don't fit the pattern. They don't match Western Neanderthals, and they certainly don't seem to derive from glacial conditions alone. Instead, their robustness may be inherited from ancient humans adapted to heat, not cold. From ancestors in places like the Levant, South Asia, or even Equatorial Africa. This, then, is the key distinction between the Denisova and Chagorskaya Neanderthals. The former, isolated, deeply divergent, shaped by genetic bottlenecks and rare admixture events with tropical humans. The latter, mobile, culturally continuous, and linked directly to Western Europe. While the Denisova Neanderthal remains genetically and morphologically unique, the Chagorskaya population fits squarely within the Western Neanderthal framework. They are the same people, separated only by time and terrain. The differences show up even in the skulls. While we lack a full Denisovan Neanderthal cranium, the bones we do have, from teeth to toe, point to deep divergence. The toe bone, known as Denisova V, for example, reveals levels of inbreeding unprecedented among Neanderthals. Her genome carries fewer shared mutations with modern humans than Chagorskaya or Vindija individuals do. She is, in every sense, an outlier, a relic of an earlier time. And yet she lived just a short distance from Chagorskaya, perhaps separated by centuries, perhaps by mere generations. And yet the genetic gulf between them is enormous. No shared ancestry, no shared tools, no shared culture. The Chagorskaya people brought something new into that landscape, the Western Neanderthal legacy. If you haven't already, this is the perfect time to subscribe to Prehistoric Medievals. These ancient crossroads of culture and genetics are more than stories. They're the key to understanding how human history truly unfolded. Let's go back to the hands, because that's where culture becomes action. The Chagorskaya fingers, unlike those of Denisova, were not hyper-robust, but they were still strong, built for gripping the heavy bifaces of the Mycokian tradition, built for butchering large game, scraping hides, crafting wooden shafts. These were hands trained over a lifetime, hands that reflect the memory of places far to the west, France, Germany. Crimea. The evidence suggests they didn't reinvent their tools in Siberia. They carried them. They maintained the traditions. The Mycokian toolkit wasn't just functional, it was cultural. Passed on, taught, refined. Like language, but made of stone. And like language, it connects these people across continents. Chagorskaya, Lafarasi, Vindija, they're all part of the same narrative thread. Archaeologically, this is unprecedented. Rarely do we see such continuity over such distance. And the fact that these tools remained unchanged, even in the harsh Siberian environment, tells us how deeply rooted they were in the identity of these Neanderthals. 
They didn't adapt to the local Denisovan ways. They brought their own, and they kept them. The question then becomes, why didn't they mix? Why didn't the Chagorskaya Neanderthals interbreed with Denisovans or earlier Altai Neanderthals nearby? Was it distance, time, culture, or was it a choice? We may never know, but what we do know is that the DNA speaks clearly. The Chagorskaya group was genetically Western, with no detectable Denisovan admixture. They were strangers in a strange land, and yet they thrived, at least for a while. Their bones speak of survival, endurance, and perhaps even hope. They survived the cold, they survived the journey, and they left behind a legacy that stretches from the caves of France to the cliffs of Siberia. Thank you for being here on this journey. If these ancient lives have moved you, if you feel the quiet echoes of our shared past, don't forget to subscribe to Prehistoric Medievals, because every fossil, every stone, every genome holds a piece of our story. And the story of the Chagorskaya Neanderthals is one of movement, memory, and the powerful bond between place and people. They were the edge of the Neanderthal world, not a dead end, but a culmination, the farthest reach of a migration that began in the warm forests of Europe and ended in the icy winds of southern Siberia. They were not outliers. They were explorers. And in the frozen soil of Shagaskaya Cave, their presence whispers still, across stone, across bone, and across the millennia. Thanks for watching.